kid comes out of Hamilton College. He's rejected as a security analyst, I believe, at Goldman. Fine, you know, everybody get in line. A lot of people are rejected. He builds a career in, I'm going to call it, bonds, leverage, finance, and such, ends up back over at Goldman Sachs and climbs on board. What was Mr. Solomon's first day at Goldman Sachs like? What was the real backstory that you've reported on? Well, first day at Goldman Sachs back in 2000 was probably filled with regret because it was a few months after the bank's IPO, so he wasn't one of their pre-IPO partners. But in the last 20 years, he's clearly built an exceptional career at the firm because now he's running Goldman Sachs Group Inc., which is undoubtedly one of the foremost Wall Street powerhouses there. When you think about investment banking, when you think about trading, when you think mm -hmm. about a bank that can communicate with governments, institutions, hedge funds, you are thinking about Goldman Sachs. Solomon's challenge is to take that and try and make it something more than that. In the last five years, he's had mixed results on that front. In your wonderful article today, I'll put it out on Twitter, folks, really, really a great summary there. You talked to a guy named Mayo, who I've known for years, and I believe it's Mike that says, look, this is a guy that nailed it, just as you said, and he had one course where he butchered it. Have you ever butchered a course, John? Sure, many times. I have many times is the operative word here. How does he fix that view tomorrow? That's the important thing. And Mike Mayo, and it's not just any banking analyst. Mike Mayo is in some ways the dean of Wall Street banking analysts. And when Mike Mayo says, look, on a scale, I can give you A-plus for your legacy businesses, which let's acknowledge is still 70% of their business. That is a good grade. But then he says he's had middling results on many other fronts, including an F grade in the consumer banking operations. And the question he's asking is, you have failed a class, and what's the consequence of that? And that's important because the perception and the image you have of a Goldman Sachs is a place that does not tolerate average. So when you have a venture, when you spend so much time into saying you could build a new platform that could become the leading digital banking firm in the country. And then that gets unraveled. That puts a lot of pressure. And even after the reorganization they announced a few months ago, that has not satisfied the partners inside the firm. That has not satisfied investors and analysts. So they are still seeking answers. So the question is, are all options still on the table? Will they be forced to do another radical revamp? Are we suggesting they're tolerating average at the top of the business? Average rating overall, yeah. That's if you listen to Mike Mayo, that's where it gets to. He's given me a scale from A plus all the way down to F, so, so and where a couple the, of B's and C's thrown in there. Where does the oversight come from? Who's responsible to correct that? At Goldman Sachs. It's interesting, unlike perhaps most other places, some of the oversight comes from people reporting into Mr. Solomon because even if it's a public company, it is still a partnership. And the partners still have a reasonable amount of sway. Ordinarily, you will say the board, but the board does not tend to act and show up and kick and, kick and scream when the performance is average. They are there for crises. They don't come and say, well, your stock's not great, your stock's so John, not bad, time's up. So Massachusetts Financial Services owns 2.04% percent of the stock and they've just learned it's a partnership is that is that what i think i heard well can Continue. you tell us how, how much tension is there between the partnerships Look, the it, partners it, it, and, and goldman ceo you can't really hide it anymore it's pretty much spilled out in the open there is clearly a lot of grumbling some would even say a semi-open revolt and they have tried to raise questions and to be fair the top of the house has recognized that david solomon john Walden recognized that there is some dissatisfaction <clears throat> in the ranks they will point to, among other things, that these are people who are yeah. unhappy with compensation in 2022 that came off the ridiculous highs of 2021, that deal-making mm -hmm. business is not back, and people are still sitting around twiddling their thumbs and will find for reasons where they can point their fingers okay. and say that's not going well. In your great article, Gorman, book ratio, 1.8. Solomon, 1.1, 1.2, whatever it is. I looked at operating income. Peter emailed in from Connecticut and said, Tom, look at operating income. Let's look at operating income right now. Morgan Stanley, 25 cents in the dollar, and I'm going to model the challenges of Goldman Sachs a lot less than that, 17 cents on the dollar. How do they get the operating income ratio up other than growthiness? Here's the amazing fact here, right? If you look over a time period of five years, and if Goldman Sachs were to make $400 billion, uh, in revenue, let's say, uh, 
Morgan Stanley were to make $350 billion, there is still a good chance that equity investors would value that more because it's much more predictable and they could model it. Whereas Goldman Sachs has perhaps made more money, but that is to their detriment. As much as 2022 was bad, in some ways the fact well, that they did so well in 2021 might also count yeah, against them. Yeah, I, I get that. I mean, I'm thinking of Brad Hintz, iconic at Sanford Bernstein years ago. Everybody hung on his black books. If Bernstein wrote a black book on Goldman Sachs right now, can they develop that perception Consistency of cash flow of the modern global Wall Street ship. And we have this line in the story. When you go back to 1999, the Goldman Sachs IPO prospectus talks about the need for building stability in earnings. They talk about how asset management will play a key role. 25 years later, we're still talking about that. That idea of ballast has been around. It's about execution. And let's be clear, Goldman Sachs has been trying to do that in the last five years. They focused a lot of effort into their asset management business, into building this alts juggernaut, sort of a mini Blackstone. 2010, when Morgan Stanley talked about going deeper into wealth management and building scale, it's not like the equity markets readily believed them. It's not like by 2015, James Gorman had a re-rating on the Morgan Stanley stock. That took a while. It didn't happen Jack. until 2018, 19, 20. Does David Solomon have that runway is the question. Here's what matters. Solomon had a cameo in billions. Did Gorman? No. Are you saying it's a personality issue? Yeah. By bringing that up, that's essentially I, yeah, what you're saying. You and I have witnessed this at Davos. I mean, I, yes, it is an interpretation or guesstimate of personality. I'm not saying that's the heart of the matter, yeah. but that's the unspoken that's out there. We're saying this with great respect for everybody at Goldman Sachs. Well, let's Sachs, stress test that for you. Mr. Solomon. Difficult to go through the counterfactual, I know. But let's go back to the original race. Lloyd Blankfein at the top, David Solomon, Harvey Schwartz. How different would it have been if the current Carlos CEO with Harvey Schwartz taking that role. Is it now, in the coming months, whenever that might be? How Great different question. would that have been if it was him that got the nod and not David Solomon? It's, it's, it's very hard to judge that way. You would have had Harvey Schwartz, who came up through the trading ranks, and perhaps five years later, we would have been well, talking about the how chase, all the traders are happy. we got to get ready for your next story. Would Harvey have done the bank like David did the bank? That's a tough question, uh, oh, Tom. Man. I, I, Sounds like I a securities analyst. No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think you can give a fair answer. The it's reason I ask the question, Sri, is because I think we often give these CEOs too much credit when things go right, throw too much mud when things go wrong. As you've pointed out, and you know, and you've said this in the last five minutes, they're super tankers, they're tremendously difficult to maneuver. I'm just wondering how much different things would have been if leadership was different. But ultimately, to Tom's point, the frustration with David Solomon that comes up continuously through reporting is not just the decisions, but it's the nature of the individual who's making the decisions. And perhaps the pandemic was a great example of that when you see all these stories that the CEO was frustrated with bumping into people who worked for Goldman in the Hamptons when the question wasn't being asked, why was Where? the CEO in the Hamptons? Is it about the personality or the decisions? Fair point. But in his defense, let me point out one thing, that the seat of the Goldman Sachs CEO is one of the hardest jobs in finance. It has a lot of scrutiny. Yep. And everyone has personality quirks. It just appears larger and brighter in that seat. So did Harvey Schwartz have certain personality quirks? Maybe. Maybe we'll find out in the Carlisle CEO sure. role. We would certainly have found yes. out if he had become the Goldman Sachs CEO.